Welcome to Forward Obsessed, where we talk to breakthrough business leaders and rising entrepreneurs about their journeys, origin stories, and aha moments. Hello and welcome to this episode of Forward Obsessed. I'm your co-host, David Salinas, and today's guest is Andre Swanston, former CEO and co-founder of True Optic, a company that would get acquired by TransUnion for over nine figures. Andre would take us through his upbringing in the Bronx, fundraising as a black man, creating a company that he would say when he would sell it, he would say how much he would sell it for. He'd set his Wi-Fi password at his office for that price. And then he would sell the company before his, the age of 40 years old and go on to be ambitious enough to try and get an MLS team in the great state of Connecticut. This is an incredible interview. I wish we had more time with him. We're going to bring him back for a part two. I hope you enjoy it. As always, stay forward obsessed. Make sure you share this one. Subscribe on all the channels you can. And we love you. Peace. Hello and welcome to this episode of Forward Obsessed. I'm your co-host, David Salinas, joined by... Pete Seva. And today we have an incredible guest, Andre Swanston. Andre, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Andre, every show we start off with trying to figure out where does the kernel, where does the DNA of entrepreneurship come from in you? Uh, we'd like to explore really your roots, where you came from, where your parents are from, who they were, what they did, and, and how you became the guy that would go on to build a $100 million plus company. So tell us a little bit about your roots. Yeah, well, um, you know, my parents are immigrants from St. Kitts and Nevis, um, which is the smallest country in the Western Hemisphere, right? The whole population of the whole country is about 50,000 people um, in the Caribbean. And I uh, grew up in the Bronx, in the Kings Ridge area of the Bronx, right off the Grand Concourse which is, you know, one of the most diverse areas in the country, if not the world, right? So, um, you know, within just my block, I had um, friends from pretty much every Caribbean island, every Central American, South American country, Eastern European, um, uh, Viet uh, Vietnam, Laos. I mean, so I just in my class, I think we had the United Nations to down pact, right? So when you grow up in a, in a mostly working class, um, um, largely immigrant neighborhood, um, you know, education is just pounded in you. Uh, it's, it's, it's all the only thing that matters, right? Is, totally is, no. is, is school and, and, you know, you know, all those families come here for opportunity, right. And, and, and this whole concept of the evolution of the family. So it was pretty rigorous in terms of, um, that and, and competitive, um, had the opportunity, you know, in, in New York city public schools. Uh, and again, this is in the, the, the late eighties. Um, starting in the second grade, they had something called the gifted and talented tract. Was, was that the ASTA program? No. So in the, in the New York state public schools, they had, uh, uh, gifted and talented, which were, um, in the same public schools that you would normally go to, but, um, it were smaller class sizes and a little bit more academically rigorous. Um, and again, very diverse. And I was in that second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. And then in fifth grade, um, applied for a program called Prep for Prep, mm -hmm. which is um, it, it's um, yeah. on Wednesday nights after school. You go down into the city and you have more school. So starting in fifth grade through through sixth grade, then on Saturdays you have school all day, all of fifth grade, all of sixth grade, and then the summer after fifth grade and the summer of, after sixth grade you have summer school five days a week all day. Um, for not like, because you did like, bad. Not because you did bad, because you did well and you're you're just, you know, you the, the exposure of the books that you're reading and the extra science work and the math work and it's just this rigorous academic training. And then you um, apply to the, the, the biggest prep schools, the most prestigious prep schools in the New York City area, right? So um, I, you know, looked at the, the Horace Mann and Dalton and Collegiate and Allen Stevenson. I ended, I ended up going to the Allen Stevenson School, which is an all-boy um, prep school on the Upper East Side. And and I think that's where everything just changed, you know, in terms of the exposure um, to um, not only the academic rigor and the, and the athletic facilities, but also um, you're going to school with some, with the children of some of the most successful families in New York City, right? So the investment bankers and the media execs and the, you know, the high, you know, the lawyers and the surgeons and stuff. And so- They go to my uh, work. Yeah, so you start to build up the, the the network and the relationships, but also it starts to seem more tangible because in your neighborhood that you're growing up in in the Bronx, 
it's um, you're you're being you're really driven to work hard to be able to achieve certain things that you're not actually really seeing those things though in front of you. No mob. So it's almost abstract, right? Um, and so being able to be in it and see it um, makes it you know even that more tangible. And so that was, I think, uh, uh, you know, taking that, you know, at 12 years old, taking the subway by yourself, 45, 50 minutes from the Bronx, the Upper East Side, that's fine in the morning, doing it at night, coming home, you know, after a game, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night um, by yourself in the winter, 12 years old, no cell phone, you know, this is, yeah. <laughs> this is the mid nineties. It's even when you look back and think about it. Um, sounds crazy. It sounds crazy. But it, but it, it also a uh, sense of kind of maturity and, and independence and drive. You know, you're 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 waking up really early in the morning, and you're not getting home to even start your homework till eight nine o'clock at night. And then you got to you know wake up six o'clock in the morning to get down to the city um, by eight. You, you know, looking back at it now, it's just training for real life, right? That's real life. People, you know, all over the country are waking up at six o'clock to get their kids up to drop them to school and then go to work. And then they're getting home late and they're dropping their kids here and there and doing stuff. And so, um, it, it, you know, I, I, you don't appreciate it sometimes when you're young, what the real, everything that you're going through and the value that is providing for you. But looking back at it, I mean, it's, it's, you know, those experiences are what me, the school hard knocks. Me, me. Yeah. That's what I mean, made me who I, am. I feel like if there was a video about school hard knocks, the first image in my mind is someone on a subway that's young. So it's like just he hearing that's kind of, Wow, yeah, you know, you're wild. doing your, you're doing your, you know, calculus on the subway, you know, in your shirt and tie and blazer and khaki pants, you know, riding the four train up to the to the Bronx. Um, but no, it's it's funny though because you always hear these. Um, and I say this all the time. You hear these stereotypes, or you see, you know, every TV show or movie is like, oh, you're in this tough neighborhood, and everybody was trying to get you to do drugs and join a gang and do it. That's partly bullshit, right? Like I'm sure that happens in some places, but I was I lived in a community that would be perceived as a rough neighborhood in the Bronx. The Bronx is the poorest borough in New York City. And, um, you know, there's, of course, people that fall fall into that. But I think there was a lot of support and pride in my neighborhood and people that were- They wanted to see you win. They wanted, they to wanted better. neighborhood kids to do well academically and athletically and, and, and stuff like that. And so I never had experiences in my, you know, within my 10 block radius while I was in school coming home you know, at night in my you know, shirt and tie and blazer. Nobody messed with me when you're 12, when you're 13, you're 14. You know, now when you're 20 blocks away and nobody knows who you are, yes, fine. That was it. That was yeah, you're sure, no right? But, but in your general neighborhood, I think people had a lot of pride in, how, in, in, in others. How was it? Because in one, so I grew up in New York City. I, I mentioned the Astor program because that was the gifted and talented program when I was, when I was a kid in Queens. Okay. So I used to get up go to a school, get go to the school where all the kids were in my neighborhood, get on a bus, and then go 50 minutes to another school that had this program for me. And uh, it was different for me. It was it was shocking to me because it was a very different type of people than were in my neighborhood. And I didn't have a lot of uh, immigrants and stuff like that in my neighborhood because I was the immigrant. My father was the Spanish guy, and we were in a predominantly white neighborhood. But here you are in this really crazy multicultural neighborhood with everybody, and now all of a sudden you're going into what I'd imagine was predominantly a white school. Was that a cultural, like, was that culturally shocking for you? Or did you not see it because of how much of a melting pot you had grown up in? I'd say it was, it was a little bit of both. So definitely my neighborhood was majority black and brown, right? So, I mean, if you, you'd probably say, you know, and again, give or take 10% here, with recollection, but I would say it was probably 30 or 40% Latino, 20 or 30 percent black and then 30 percent you know everybody else uh yeah. white um asian um indian uh and and so going to school in the upper east side where it was probably 80 percent white yeah i mean you 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 notice the the difference um uh it was a small school very very close-knit uh so it was never any issues i never felt like the, the outcast or you know totally different per se i think the distance of not being living, you know, walking distance from the school or in the Upper East Side or, or something in Manhattan uh, was probably more drastic, so to speak, than the, the racial difference. Mm -hmm. um, kids, you know, kids are better than adults, yeah. right? Like, unless, 
kids are only bad if they learn it from adults, right? Other than that, kids just learn. Yeah, kids just, you know, want to have fun and stuff like that. I will say, you know, there were some, you know, stereotypes. So for example, growing up in the in the Bronx and, and being a good athlete, you just assume you're a better athlete than the white kids. It's 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 a it's a stereotypical. I remember the first time a white kid like you know, crossed me up from the basketball court and it was like better than me. I was like, oh my God, like, I'm gonna be like, you know what I mean? Or the, 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 he was like a black coach. <laughs> like, you know, so I, I think one of the things which I'm, um, you know, I, I haven't had these specific conversations with some of my buddies from, from back then, uh, but I'm sure they had maybe some of their own stereotypes about me and, and we had, you know, one other, one of my, one of my best friends, um, and it'd be my best man at my wedding and we still talk, you know, 30 years later, um, also lives in the Bronx. So we, you know, we're the, the Bronx crew, the only two Bronx kids in the whole school, right? That would, so we would take the train. So I'm sure there's some stereotypes about us and we had stereotypes um, maybe about um, some of those students. I think the beautiful thing about when you get to be around each other is that you get to realize most of your stereotypes are bullshit, right? And so I got to appreciate, no, these these dudes are freaking good athletes here. Like, holy shit, you know what I mean? Like, and and they probably were like, oh, these dudes are good students. I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm just assuming um, but I think that, that, that is one of the, the great opportunities, I think, for people in this country, just working together. And, you know, I don't want to, it sounds cliche and like, oh, you know, all, you know, pie in the sky utopia. But, um, I, you know, I can think of examples like that through high school, through college, through professional life is like the more people interact with each other, the more they realize we got, you know, a lot in common and a lot of similar um even though with you know, people you know you know another thing I, I mentioned same same to that is i also went in there and i still have a chip on my shoulder right and i went in there with a the chip on the shoulder like this is my opportunity like to to you know make it in life and make my family proud and be rich when i grow up like all those things you have when you're you know putting on your tie to leave the house you know 7 a.m um and you think that you are more motivated than other people like oh they're rich already. They're not going to work as hard as that. And you don't realize that there's different pressures on people regardless of their background or different ambitions. And so there were some kids that had the pressure of being like, my dad went to Princeton. No, my to see grandfather went to Princeton. Him. My great grandfather went to Princeton. My uncles went to Princeton. If I don't get into Princeton, I'm a loser. Literally, there was kids there that would work so yeah. hard because of the pressure of expectation of living up to the status yeah. that their family had, right? Look at the, look at the suicide rates now in kids uh, yeah. in some of those areas, right? Like it's, the numbers are crazy if you dig into the data, so. Yeah, and so <laughs> we all, we got different backgrounds, but everybody has different motivations, right? And I think one of the things that a lot of people are dismissive about still today is they, everybody thinks that they are more motivated than somebody else. Right. Oh, poor people are, they're poor because they're not motivated. You hear that bullshit yeah. all the time. Right? So you get across to the basketball field, right? <laughs> or this race isn't as motivated or suburban versus rural versus urban versus whatever. Like everybody thinks other people are less deserving or less motivated or less hard. Everybody thinks that it's BS. <laughs> like it's more about the individual, their family, what their things and stuff like that. And it, there's different motivations for everybody. And I think that was one of the things two that was very eye-opening that um you know it didn't matter where people came from like you know, people could be good athletes they could be good students they could be hard workers they have pressures and stresses and stuff like that so it was like there's evidence like two kids same family same upbringing one becomes mega successful and one becomes a drug addict and 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 fails in life like there's just there's there's it it there's choices. nothing. Choices. Yeah, there's choices. For me, I grew up. I had my my best friend was like, "Hey, I want to grow up and and go work in the union and 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 do my thirty years and retire and top out at a hundred thousand dollars a year." And I was like, "That sounds terrible to me." <laughs> I was like, "I want to be rich because yeah. I was poor." And my, so yeah. we we just it just did, I agree with you a hundred percent. Yeah. So where did the so your parents were? What did they do for a living? Yeah, so my dad was more of the entrepreneurial one. I mean, he he worked at a company called Aberdeen, which did like um, uh, manufacturing of um, like textiles, comforters, and curtains. They did white labeling, so a lot of the big 
quote unquote luxury brands really were just white labeling on on this stuff. And so he did sales there. And that's what he did when I was younger. He then went on to be the director of sales at Cablevision. Um, but he always did things on the side, right? It's throwing an event or, um, you know, buying at bulk, uh, all those the bed sheets and curtains and stuff like that. And our whole house would be like a display center and neighborhood people would come in and he'd sell, sell the stuff. Um, Pretty awesome. So always just saw him doing multiple things, right? Um, and then my mom was an accountant. Uh, she was at the New York Post and then uh, a couple uh, like publishing startups. And then she ended up um, um, being a assistant controller at uh, a SUNY, at SUNY Purchase yeah, sure. Later in Life. So I also saw the evolution of my family, right? So they were pushing me to do stuff. And then I also saw, you know, we... We were five people in a one bedroom apartment on Cedric Avenue in the Bronx, right? When I was a young kid. On Cedric? Yeah. Uh twenty five seventy five. Uh, Birth of hip hop. Yeah. Cedric's no, theater. Yeah, not that far away from where I where I uh, lived until um from birth until eight years old. Um, then we moved um about fifteen minutes away to Briggs, um, off the Grand Concourse and uh to a house, right? And one of the nicer houses in the neighborhood, right? So I, I saw us from being in a one bedroom apartment to one of the nicer kind of row houses in that part of the Bronx. Um, and then, uh, and then you know, my mom went back to school, went to grad school. Uh, then they moved to when I was in college, they moved to Westchester to an even nicer house. So I saw kind of the the from when I was really young to then high school to then being older, I saw my parents kind of have their own kind of evolution. Um, and, and that was one of the things that my dad always talked to me. I think the first time, uh, maybe nine, ten, uh, about the evolution of the family. And the only job that you have is to provide more opportunity for your kids one day than I'm able to provide for you. And he's talked about he's been able to provide more for me than his dad was able to provide for him. And that's kind of the definition of success. It's not a specific dollar amount. It's not you know, um, tangible things. It's like, if you can provide better life, better opportunity for your kids and next generation, then you're successful. Progress unlocks possibilities. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I've always had that in my mind that that is my only mission in life. And then, and then you think about, if you think about it as like a, a, a race, a relay race, right? Um, Almost like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like you pass it off and <laughs> it's like, well, you know, maybe we were in 10th place when we got it, when I got it and you know, if we can be in seventh place or sixth place and then, and so I would think about it now, like I'm clearly have done that in terms of, you know, what I've accomplished and stuff like that off of the, 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 the back of my parents. Um, but I think about, well, how far can I pass it? Like, all right, if we, we start off in 10th then we may probably have started off in hundredth, right? Like, <laughs> uh, I love that metaphor. It's a great, it's just like, okay, well, can I get up to 50th or 40th or second? Like, you know, how far can we go here? And so I think about that all the time. I see you winning the race. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, you know, it's it's one of those races that never ends. Started. Right? You're, you're still young, man. Yeah. I'm. Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because you know, once you hit forty, you don't feel as if you're young anymore, right? But it's all relative. Look at the look, 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 Don't let the light fuse you. We got some grays in here. So look at the guys that have done it from their forties and under, right? Sam Walton started Walmart and is forty-seven years old. Mm -hmm. and, he, like, and that turned into yeah. what it is. Look, I mean, look, I had my exit and I was still 39 and that was like a big goal for me. When I started, I was like, I had this exit before I hit 40. It's just so I can be like, oh, I did it in my 30s, right? So, Yeah. So so you were track and field star? I wouldn't say star. I would say in high school, it was a star. In college, <laughs> <laughs> I was on the team, right? You know, the 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 talent level, you know, especially division one college track is I think a step below Olympic and pro level. All the best collegiate athletes, those of them you see represented, whether it's the United States or the Caribbean islands or um, uh, you know, other other countries, that's what you see a year or two later in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so no, I, I uh, if you're talking about high school, yeah, star, college, no, not at all. You're still <laughs> athletic? Um, in my mind, uh, <laughs> I would say I don't, um, other than uh, supporting my kids in there, and so maybe you know playing pickup in the in the yard with my kids, I don't really okay. do much sports um, at all. I mean, I've been the last twelve years. I've just been doing seventy plus hour weeks working. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to end up on your ass like Mark Zuckerberg did recently. I don't know about that. I mean, I I I, I you saw that right. He 
broke his his ACL. Yeah, he messed his ACL up. He had to get surgery and everything because he was doing fight MMA. And oh no, I he, told me I, 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 I've seen pictures of him doing MMA. I didn't know yeah. he got hurt. Yeah, he got hurt. He just he just posted. I felt bad. Yeah. Tore his leg. And, uh, I'm sure, the board loved that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you finished school, and you went into finance. Is that the typical sort of like that's where the money's at? So let's go that way. So partially. So um, your mom was your mom had a financial background, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say you know. Now, for all the kids, or for over the last 10 years or so, I'd say every kid coming out of uh, college is like, well, I'm going to start a tech startup. That's the in vogue thing to do. I feel like how damn hard it is to raise capital today. <laughs> yeah. In the 90s and the early 2000s, is, is I, I want to be an investment banker. I want to go work on Wall Street. You know, it was Goldman or JP or Beer Stearns, Lehman. Like, those, that's where if you really made it, that's what you do. And then you go there for a few years, then you go back to, to get your MBA. Like, that was the blueprint. Um, I, you know, after, uh, I, I stopped doing track after junior year. Um, and so senior year, I was just promoting parties and events and throwing concerts all, all throughout Southern New England. Um, and so, you know, I, I went back home and, and worked at a boutique shop for a bit, but pretty much for about nine months, that whole time I was just raising capital to try to open my own nightclub or restaurant, um, which I did. And so I opened um, a spot when I was 23 years old and um, uh, made a lot of mistakes. We were bringing in a lot of cash, but, you know, didn't have the proper legal advice, didn't have the proper kind of financial structure and partner structure. And then the um, um, the person that was supposed to be my anchor investor pretty much tried to squeeze me out of my own business. Um, and that was a valuable lesson just in terms of, you know, making sure you, you do the the... The, the work to be prepared and you spend the capital that's needed to structure things right in a business. So that was a tough lesson. Um, I ended up uh, suing him and got a, the, the, the settlement and, and he had to buy me out of pretty much my own business. And, and this is where a kind of ego came in. I was so determined that to beat him and, and accomplish what I said I was going to accomplish where I said it was going to accomplish that I opened up a, a, a venue, maybe a quarter mile away and competed against my own business plan because I had put in everything in place and, and, and won, but wasn't making any money, right? Because then it became a race to the bottom and this, this, and that. And so um, that wasn't as successful. And so that was also a valuable lesson too, right? It was like, okay, I wasn't f properly prepared. I actually had a great business because it was making tens of thousands of dollars on good night, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I didn't do the work to be prepared to execute on it fully. And then second mistake was I let ego make me go in and do something that probably should have went and opened up in Hartford or a different city and, and then done the same concept again, right? But not in the same area. Act, um, pe act petty, you'll end up penniless. Yeah. And so um, right around that time, you know, that's when my mom was like, you know, why don't you just get a real job? <laughs> that's, that, that's that conservative immigrant get a real job like you're with the school like you know why are you even doing this foolishness right my family oh. still tells me when i'm a job <laughs> i'm like that's a really good question mom and dad um and so that's when i, I actually went to ameriprise financial um in east harford start doing recruiting. and start doing the recruit yeah so ameriprise um was still american express financial First. advisors um and just great training i mean just learning how to how to sell to people how to manage planning and strategy because they were like the 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 first company to really really focus on financial planning much less asset management part of it and so I uh, started to work with a lot of small business owners in Connecticut in terms of doing retirement planning and um, business succession planning um, uh, worked with a couple of school districts to get their 403b and retirement accounts so they, that's you know Long, and the, those, those sales may be 18 months to close that deal. So that's where I kind of learned long-term enterprise account selling, right? And and um, just great opportunity. And then I, I got recruited to go to J.P. Morgan Chase on the wealth management side. And then uh, my wife at the time had got a job at Danbury Hospital. We were living in Vernon. We moved to Danbury. I, uh, she was at Danbury Hospital. I was um, working at... Um, JPMC uh, in Westchester on, on doing wealth management as well. Um, you know, Northern Westchester is one of the most affluent areas in America. 
So the, the, the net worth of the individuals that I started working with and its account sizes got, got larger and then, you know, more complex when you're thinking about the different types of assets that people um, uh, invest in. And that's, and it, what was really interesting about that is that's when I first kind of really started to understand, uh, bless you, when I first started to really understand um, angel investing because I had clients that were taking out 250 grand, 100 grand, half a million dollars, because everybody thought their next door neighbor's son was the next Zuckerberg, right? Like that's what it was, like, oh, it's gonna be the next Facebook, or this is gonna be the... And the more money they pull out of the account, the less money you have under management, so you're... Yeah, I mean, in the big scheme of things for management, it was inconsequential, so that wasn't it, but, but that's when kind of my mind said like, you're investing in that dumbass idea. Like I would see some of the things and, you know, it wasn't my lane. So I would say, oh, you know, this could be risky, but does it fit your overall profile? It's 2% of your net worth or 5%, whatever, fine. Even if I think the actual investment is stupid, it fit into their overall plan. Um, but then that's when I said to myself, I saw with the restaurants and the nightclubs and the concerts and different things that I, were going, that I was doing, the kind of shift over between 2002 and say 2011, where... In 2002 to 2005, if you're throwing an event, you have your street team out putting flyers on cars and let the let out of bars and events. You're buying an, uh, an ad in the local newspaper and maybe you're buying some local radio ads. That was it. 10 years later, you're, adver- you're buying ads on Facebook. You're buying ads on streaming radio. You're, you know, it's just different ways that you needed to engage kind of that that 18 to 30, 18 to 25 year old market. And um, I, I just knew that streaming was going to be where all everything eventually went as, as you know, back then it was, at, my, my thesis was as internet speeds get faster, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, remember we didn't even talk about that anymore, right? But back then it was as internet speeds get faster and, and devices get more uh, advanced chips and, and software and stuff like that streaming will just be an on-demand control of what you watch and listen to will be where things go. And then I'm like, I see all these people investing in the stupidest companies ever. And that's when I was like, I'm going to raise millions of dollars. I'm going to start this company that's going to control the future of digital media and streaming. And I'm going to be a billionaire. I remember that was like what I, that was what I told my wife. I was like, that's what happened. She's like, and we have an, a two-year-old and like an infant. <laughs> like that's what, that's the plan. Um, I don't remember how long it took to make the decision if it was weeks or if it was months I, I just it's like a cloud now but at some point she gave me the green light like the okay to and she's always been supportive i mean we you know did the restaurants nightclubs together um even making when I, mean, I did my first concerts and stuff like that so we'd always a boyfriend girlfriend even used to doing stuff together um so can we yeah. let's pause there and i want to explore this i think there's a lot of we have we have entrepreneurs, real entrepreneurs that, that are watching this. And we also have entrepreneurs. We have people that want to get in the business, uh, want to start something. And I think that some people will say, I was young and I didn't have anything anchoring me. So I was able to do this, right? I was in my twenties. I had no risk. So I had, yeah, zero no risk. And then there are people that are more in their thirties or forties or have children at different age ranges. And they're, terrified explore let's explore that moment for you because i think it's going to be helpful for some of the people that are listening to this Mm -hmm. that are that are in that i'm having a baby i have a baby i have a a small a toddler i have a teenager like what what are the things that you have to check what are the boxes you need to check to make sure that this is the right move for you because it's never too late people do start businesses in their 30s 40s 50s 60s um, so like try and go back for a second and like explore that with us. Um, this is going to sound, um, like I'm almost being facetious, but I think it's just in your DNA, right? I mean, there's never a right time. And, and, uh, I personally, and now looking back, like angel investing in founders, I almost won't invest in somebody that's not risking a lot. Like if you're all in, if it ain't going to hurt, if you fail, if you're not, absolutely terrified <laughs> of what you're doing, but you're not hungry enough at that then, point. Then yeah. I, I just don't, I, you know, I, if people, you know, the 20 something year old is like, oh, I got nothing to lose, whatever. To me, it's also easier to quit mm-hmm. because like, whatever, I, I'll go back to work or do something like that. 
That's a it's great the, point. that thirty something year old, forty something year old with a mortgage and kids, yeah. no plan B, responsibilities. Yeah. That person is gonna freaking kill themselves to make it work. Like mm-hmm. they are all in because you know they 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 can't afford yeah to not be successful. I can't lose. Um, and so for me, I think if I were twenty four without kids without you know the responsibilities that i had i was ambitious then and i try stuff but i don't know that i would have been able to withstand all the rejection all the disappointment all the frustration um that i dealt with in my 30s trying to build true optic mm-hmm. it was brutal mentally emotionally physically spiritually in every possible way that you could imagine. Um, and we'll definitely talk about why that is. And I think that's where there was some more uniqueness to to my narrative um, than than a lot of other people that I was competing against. Um, how, how much how much of, of making this decision has to do with the selection you make on your partner, right? Because you talked about your wife was with you. Do a ride or die. Yeah, ride or die, doing nightclubs. So she was hustling with you. Yeah, no, absolutely. So does you think that that, like, where would you, you, you put that on the scale, like, as far as, like, who your partner is is going to make a big difference? Yeah, no, listen, your team is is everything. The team is more important than the product early on because you can, you, can, uh, you can adapt, you can pivot. <laughs> it's hard to just have a new team, right? Yeah. So the team is everything. So I, uh, my co-founder was... Um, uh, I meant your partner and your wife. Yeah, well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about both. Oh, right, right. So, I, so I also had a I had a technical co-founder that was one of my closest friends that we went to high school together. Yeah, went to boarding school together. Lives in the same dorm. He's a mechanical engineer, mathematician, Carnegie Mellon. And so, I would not have just started a tech startup without somebody that could do the tech, <laughs> right? You know, 2012, 2013, It wasn't today where you just can have like uh, engineers in a box and go on a website and build a team in two seconds. I'm not saying that always necessarily works for everybody, but you can do that. You can start a company now without having any technical expertise much more realistically than you could have uh, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so my confidence in being able to, to go out and try to start this tech media company was because I also had supreme confidence in my technical co-founder's ability to build something. Like I thought he was a genius and I was just like, hey, I know I can market, I know I can sell, and I know he can build, right? And then what we found is neither of us was that great operationally though, (laughs) you know what I mean? In terms of the the day-to-day, you know, things of you gotta file this, you gotta have this, you gotta pay that, you have to, you know, report that. And that's where- um, The devil's on the details for sure. that's where my wife came in. That's where Michelle came in because all that tedious stuff that I didn't want to do or didn't, wasn't good at or was a distraction from what needed, what I needed to do on my end and same to it, my co-founder that wasn't like, he didn't want to deal with this person or that person. He just wanted to, you know, geek out and, and, and code. And so that's where she was critical for us. And so it, if she wasn't involved, no way in the world we raise capital and, and build a business and have clients. If he wasn't involved, no way we have a min- uh, even the first product. <laughs> so she was part of the business. Oh, yeah, yeah. She ended up being the chief client officer. And then after we were acquired by TransUnion, she, frankly, was more important than I was when we were, when we were at TransUnion. She, yeah, she managed the whole, de- our core business. And I did not realize it was a family affair. I was just talking about how the family, the yeah. family dynamics of starting a business. Yeah. I didn't realize that you it, actually it started, had a family it, business. It, it started off with her being more supportive. Uh, uh, several months in, uh, a few months in, it was, she was actually working full time and helping to run the company because we frankly needed her. Um, but um, what I think what was important too is, you know, again, we had small kids. I'm traveling all over the place. I was, you know, LA, San Francisco, France, like, you know, France, Vegas, CES. Like, so I was always traveling. And, um, but you know, you have two young kids at home. And you have a wife that's also working full time. And so I would, at least 10 times, I would take the first flight, that 540 euro out of Newark um, AM, go do three meetings in LA and take the red eye back. 
Wow. Sleep on the plane at work at the office the next day. And it was brutal. I, I don't know if I could physically do that that much now, but when you're like 35 and hustling, right? Um, do you ever have any health issues? Of course. Yeah. Of, of course. Like, I, I, I mean, I, I don't, I've never really acknowledged this, but I, I went to the ER twice for like exhaustion. I didn't tell anybody. Yeah. My wife knew, but because uh, I didn't want investors to blow. Like, I, I mean, we're not going to cut this guy's check. He's going to die or something like that. I think it's important to know that because people like, I mean, people burn out and they think you, you just burn out at your job. Like entrepreneurs burn out and they, they, they sacrifice everything. Body, mind, soul, or spirituality, like you said. I would say almost, you know, not putting other people's business, almost, I would say more than half of the execs at our company had some sort of, you know what I mean? Like not, not necessarily related specifically to exhaustion or the work, but you know, people deal with life, Yeah, yeah. whether it's cancer, or loss of a, a close family member or um, other medical issues and stuff like that, you know, and, and you've got to figure out how to navigate that. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and that's not to mention COVID then happening too, which mm-hmm. I think um, was difficult on a lot of CEOs. So you had to very quickly adapt not only your business, but how you interact and manage your team. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it was, uh, it, you know, it's funny because in 2008, so I was a financial advisor during the crash, during the financial crisis. One of the things I have a lot of pride on is I never lost one client. I had a lot of, I saw people hiding, like they didn't want to pick up the phone to talk to their clients. Mm-hmm. I went on attack mode. Like I proactively was calling them and talking about the strategy. Hey, our strategy, we've talked about the market ain't gonna always go up and you may lose 10, 20, 30, 40%. Um, or you, some years you may make that. At the end of the day is, you know, you you say you wanna pay for your daughter's wedding in the next five to 10 years. You wanna retire in 15 years. You wanna buy that house in South Carolina. I can tell you that we're still on track for doing that. Here's some adjustments we're gonna make, but at the end of the day, you're still on track for doing that. So, you know, don't panic, right? I didn't lose one client. In fact, I grew my I got grew my business because I was calling the people who their advisor wasn't picking up. Say, have you heard from your guy at Merrill? Or oh no, he's he's ignoring you. Oh no, no. Well, here's how what I'm doing with my clients. And so I would say same thing for us with 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 COVID. Our our business exploded. You're a wartime CEO, right? You know how to deal with it. Yeah, our our business exploded in COVID. We were in attack mode, man. Like it, it was, um, and. And so it, you also got to have that team to do it. You you can be a wartime CEO and be an attack mode if you don't got the soldiers, if you don't have the the lieutenants and the colonels and the you don't know the 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 people that you, you're just gonna be attacking by yourself and losing, right? But we had a we had a really good team. How'd you find them? Well, what do what do you look for? Let's talk about that for a second. Let's explore your team building. Yeah. So we were fortunate in that. Um, there's some luck in it too. And I think that's one thing that, that people, everybody wants to sound like they're just so great. And it wasn't, there was some luck in, in even finding some of the team members. So we had, I, I'd, I'd say there was kind of four groups of, of team members. We had natural market. So I had people that either went to high school or college with that I knew, right. That were some of those people were on our team. My co-founder I went to high school with, right. Um, I had a finance I went to college with and was one, one of my frat brothers, right? Obviously my wife. Um, I had a, a friend that worked with me at, at, at JP. Um, so there's that. Then we had a couple people that we lucked out, you know, post jobs on Indeed or something like that, interviewed, get you out know, 10 people and pick one and that one ended up being great. We had probably three or four people where it was cold, no referral, no nothing, but they just end up being great. Um, we had investors that for more senior executive levels that would say, Hey, you know, I know such and such used to work with me at AOL or work with, work for me at Comcast. You should meet with them. And so we had, uh, a couple great executives really key, our, our, our chief operating officer and a couple others that were referred to us by partners or investors. Um, and then the last one is the last group is we had a couple of people that just like cold pitched us like, hey, hey I want to work for you, I heard, see what you're doing and, and kind of pitch themselves, right? And so that was really where 
um, uh, our, our team was built. And, and one of the things that I have a lot of um, pride about is we are far and away the most diverse team in the entire industry. Like, it, it, I don't even know who was second because they were irrelevant, right? They were so far away from us that didn't matter. Like, we had, I mean, we had everything. We had every race, religion, um, sexual orientation, we had all that. And we, were, and we just did what we had to do um, and, and, and uh, really, really proud of it. So, yeah, yeah so I mean, clearly the power diversity, the, you know, the, the math supports it, right? So clearly you experienced that with the success. I want to roll back a little bit if we could. So you had the vision, you had the talent, but you didn't have the capital in the beginning. And one of the things I want to dig into, because I know a lot of folks that are tuning in is, you know, as a black founder, you know, I think the stat was last year, less than 2% of funding goes yeah, to- Last black quarter was less than point less than point 0.2. Yeah. It was like less than eight point. or something. That's- Yeah. Look, if if I were intentionally trying to discriminate against somebody, I feel like more than 0.18 would slip through the cracks by accident. Think about it. Like if you were like, oh, I don't want to work with this person or I don't, when it was redlining for, for, for houses, when it was, you know, acceptance into university, like think about when there was legalized discrimination in this country, more than 0.18% was able to get through by accident. So when I look at the numbers going down, you know, to drop 90%, yeah. it was already, 2% was already pathetic. And to drop 90% since then, with all the hype and talk about, oh, this, you know, this person has a billion dollar fund for, for, for black founders or this person, it's all bullshit, right? It's all bullshit. Ask, ask half of those companies, to all these numbers that they announced in, in 2020 or 2021, ask what percentage of that capital has been deployed. Most of them, it's, it's single digit, 15%, 20%, three years later, it is, um, I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's pathetic. It's pathetic, right? Most, most of them, what I've seen, sorry to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. what I've seen, cause I've dealt building the tech school, the nonprofit, trying to get more black and brown technology folks into this business. What I've seen talking to a, and I raised $5 million and, and it was a struggle to do so. And I needed to get much more. What I saw was that corporations were setting up funds and not really hiring fund managers, but really hiring corporate communications folks to just talk to talk and go and hit, sit down and talk about DE and I and they, and they never deployed capital and they would just donate twenty five fifty thousand dollars checks to stuff and not actually deploy the capital in anything at least on the corporate on the corporate yeah. side I think that's I think that's part of it I think I think even in the venture capital community um, a lot of it is who you know and people just investing and reinvesting in their own networks. Um, I think a lot of partners of venture capital firms are very removed, frankly, from real innovation. Forget race. Like, I think a lot of them just are shitty. Anyway, like, if you look at their batting average, it's like, okay, you invest in 10 companies, eight of them are out of business, and two are, or, or have mediocre, if that returns, and then two are successful, right? And But if you have a billion dollar fund or, or $300 million fund and you spray and pray enough, in your kind of network, <laughs> you're going to have some wins and that kind of makes them look like they're doing something, right? So I think I think the venture capital community is just not that impressive, right? Frankly, and you know, I'll probably get some slack for saying that, but no, numbers don't lie if you look at their returns, right? Most, a lot of the quote unquote blue chip venture capital firms or a lot of these firms, their returns are mediocre at best over the last 10 years. Even the heroes, Hendricks and Horowitz, publicly said years ago that this was the number you had to hit and when his first fund finally closed completely he came in under that number yeah i mean i don't i don't know the specifics of that but i, I would just say look a lot of these venture funds i couldn't even get meetings with yeah but right. i want to talk about i want to talk about that let's not let's not talk about all the stuff that's wrong because we know there's a ton of it's wrong and there's plenty of headlines for that what i know that the audience really wants to hear from you what i know that there's a lot of underrepresented founders that are going to watch this episode and hear this episode you broke through. You had everything against you at that particular time and you found a way to break through. What I want to hear, what audience to hear is how did you break through? You couldn't get those meetings clearly because of these biases. How did you break through and how would you suggest to your young yourself you break through? Because that's the thing that I think the audience would get a lot of value from. Um, I had a team that was really good um, and persistence and perseverance. We just didn't quit. 
I mean, we just kept going and going and going and we just outmaneuvered companies. Um, so one of the things that we realized is, is that we knew we weren't going to be as well capitalized and well con as well connected as some of the companies that we were going to be competing against. And so we said to ourselves, how do we skate where the puck is going, get there first and lock it up so that even, you know, so, so example of that is we built capabilities and solutions across connected TV um, and publisher tools to be able to segment their audiences to, 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 to enhance the way they could deliver advertising for advertisers. Um, and one of the two, two, two things that really broke through for us were we went all in on connected TV. Everybody was still trying to worry about digital or their chart, uh, you know, mobile and desktop or linear TV or set top box targeting. And I said to myself, that's not where it is. That's not where the real growth is going to be. It is going to be in connected TV. While even though that was, you know, 1% or less of the market, we just decided, okay, everybody's asleep at the wheel on that. You were first mover. We are going to go first and we are going to build all of our tools around connected TV. And we started talking about being the best at OTT, connected TV. That was, we, we are, you know, 2014, 2015, our, all of our marketing dollars, which were nothing compared to others, but we went all in. Everything said, we're, we're the only company built for OTT. We're the best at connected TV. We were the best because we were the only, frankly, right? So, but... <laughs> But we just we we just kept on pounding that we're the best we're the best we're the best we're the best at connected TV connected TV connected TV, and but when you're a category of one you're you have competitors of none right like you look at all the the greats like HubSpot coined the term inbound marketing you know Drift who we had to have cancel on coined the term you know conversational commerce with the, with the bot with the chat bot right with Drift it's like you carved out the lane that didn't yet exist and then at that point. Clearly, there's a lot of copycats. We hear OTT getting thrown around today, 2023. It's like, yeah. it's a regular term. Yeah. And we knew like, okay, how, in order to leverage data to use at these household shared devices, these TVs where you don't know for sure who's watching it, but you know the household makeup. I came up with the, the term household graph and building a graph. And we patented the concept of a household graph in 2014. That's dope. Right? And then we went to the smaller publishers that were actually innovating in connected TV. We went to Sony Crackle. Pluto TV, Zumo, Tubi TV, um, and some of these other companies that were small startups like us, bigger than we were, but they were still startups. And we went and did multi-year deals with these guys and providing services. And come 2018, 2017, all those companies start to be acquired by Fox and Viacom and all these. And we're, we're now in with the big boys. And people have been hearing for four years that we're the best. And so what everybody started caring about connected TV in 2018, we had the most integrations. We had the most um, notoriety as being experts in that space. And then we had by then built up all the tools and IP and stuff like that. So 2018, 2019, which is massive growth for us. And then 2020 was game over because- Love that. Streaming just blew up and that's all anybody cared about. And everybody was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And then- we had two choices. We could have tried to raise more capital or we could have sold. And I was still jaded by the concept of, I did not have confidence that the capital would be there for us, even though we deserved it, even though our revenue was growing exponentially, we had multi-year contracts, every single thing that every venture capital firm or private equity firm says they want, we had. But I honestly did not believe or have confidence in the industry to fully capitalize us an evaluation that we deserved. And so when large um, media companies and uh, other companies started looking at potentially acquiring us, we just said, you know what, let's take the win. I told investors um, in 2013, when we first raised, we were gonna exit for this amount. As your wife, I passed right at your office, yeah. right? And, and yeah, our wife, literally our wife, anybody that's, that went to our office, everybody that worked the company, we had our Wi-Fi password from 2014, we had a little variation changes, but it was the same password and it was what we were going to exit for. So when we knew That's that we can, when we knew we could hit that number, we were just like, all right, it's game was done. I want to, I, I got to, I got to say one thing though, because I, I don't want the audience to lose this. The lesson here, folks, is learning to play the long game. Because just like when you were at Meriprise and everybody was afraid to call their clients and you were leaning in, everybody was leaning out, you were leaning in. The, the partnerships that you made with the crackles and the different things, 
all long game partnerships, right? Everyone sees overnight success, overnight success, but what they don't see is that long game. So I think the long game that that you've been playing your whole career in different capacities is something I just wanted to highlight and acknowledge you on because it's strategic as hell. So I appreciate it. Yeah. My job job in the interview sometimes is to press a little bit. Mm -hmm. I would challenge that it wasn't, it maybe, maybe you could have raised money at that time because 2020 is when everybody COVID hit and then valuation started to go bananas because so much money flooded into the industry. So people started making bets and valuations went up. Yep. You had, a. I see, I, I, I spot patterns in these interviews sometimes. And again, look, you did well. I know a little bit about you and I know you did well and you're not fighting for food right now. Okay. <laughs> but I also know that you're an ambitious dude. And I look back and I say to myself, the nightclub move where you opened up the nightclub down the block was because you had, a, you, 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 something in you sort of like didn't l- allow you to let go of that fight. Mm-hmm. The, as a fuck you move as we're like, yeah, there it was. was. The, the second thing the second thing I said I hear is you set a goal of selling the company before you were 40 of exiting a company before you were 40 and you had a number but in hindsight 2020 is when like streaming really took off because now you got Disney entering the game Hulu's taking off everybody's now 2023 people are shedding uh 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 commercial uh, excuse me uh channels right nobody linear wants TV, yeah. yeah linear TV is going by the wayside and 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 the one thing that I see in you that is so powerful and is and, and, and akin to, to where I come from is that your network is truly your net worth, right? Your network in the Bronx that led to the network in the prep schools and so on and so forth has led you to all those things. By this time now, you've made enough right bets that I feel like you probably could have raised money and really done well. Yeah. So... Listen, I mean, I, I don't don't worry. Of course, I've thought about it, but going back to that kind of strategic long term vision, right? There's also and also kind of the real life aspect of it, right? As any CEO or, or leader, I also knew that I had a team that was underfunded, understaffed, and been outperforming year after year after year. They're probably tired too. And I knew I was like, I don't know how much more we got in us. Yeah, right. So I, I I said that I had two C level executives that had been in the hospital in 2020. And I said to myself, I don't know how much they have and I don't know how much the team has. You gotta get the W to, on the board to, to keep yeah. to keep fighting. And you gotta remember in 2020, yeah, streaming is growing up, but we're also like the world could be over in two years. This could be it. Yeah. Right. And so I'm saying, Ambiguity and I can take the win off the board. I changed the lives of me and a whole lot of people. Right. Um, yeah. And then I have You're the cre- and then I have the yeah. credibility that I did it. Yeah. And then what can I? If when the world, if the world comes to an end, now my family's, you know, and there's an ark being built, or there's some <laughs> bunker, I can pay to get into the thing, and and we'll survive, right? <laughs> like literally, that's what I'm thinking. I'm not even being joking. I, I literally said, okay. If everything goes to, to, you know, crap here, how am I going to make sure my family survives and all these people that have sacrificed so much yeah. can take care of their families? So there was that. Um, um, but then also, too, we were not stupid. We structured the deal with some back-end incentives so that if we continued to crush it, we would make even more money after the acquisition. And we did. We demolished it. And we did really well. So everybody still, you know, got to got some a, a nice pop in twenty one and, and and subsequently. But then also too, I had this goal of I want to own a professional soccer team. All right, here we go. I, and and I knew, I knew that it needed, I needed the exit to be able to start working on that. Mm-hmm. And that if I was locked in and I raised capital, now I'm talking about going several more years, and I wouldn't be able to to start on that vision. So. In terms of long term, and I actually even told investors when I wanted to get you know board approval and thing to sell the company, I said flat out, we may be underselling for what the opportunity speculative could be, but here's a great win for everybody, and we're going to do some back end incentives that I can give you guys uh, even more of a pop. And I guaranteed them, as I, I promise you, we'll, we will hit these numbers. And then I then I said, and in two years, I'm going to start working on starting the soccer team, and I hope you guys re up. 
Like literally, that was a conversation so, in the board meeting. <laughs> I want to go. To, I want to go to the soccer team. Yeah. First of all, thank you for letting me press you a little bit. Yeah. Because I think came out, what came out of that is an incredible show of empathy, team awareness, leadership, leadership. Like just, just and that's what that's the magic of this show. So we we have to press into those areas. So thank you for that. So before we get to the soccer team, we've had. I'd say now we're getting closer to like 90, 95% of our guests on the show have been exited founders, okay? And there's a, everybody has a different, uh, a, a different story of when the wire hits. Yeah. Because that is a, that is a transformative moment and it doesn't, oh, it, it sometimes we've heard a variety of stories for people. I want you to go back in your mind, if you got to close your eyes for a second, and I want you to remember that moment, not when the contract was signed, but when the wire hit, what was it like for you? What happened? Yeah, no, I, I'll never forget it. Um, my wife and I were in our basement. That's where our kind of office was. And we had like a, a lounge. We spent most of our time in, in the basement. Um, uh, it was supposed to be a man cave, but it ended up being more of a, a man and woman cave. <laughs> <laughs> right. And escape um, from the children. Yeah. And uh, Parental paradise. <laughs> and... Um, started bawling man started crying it was just such a relief i had just it wasn't it, it was one of them ugly snotty t cries man i was just it was it was just a, it was just it was just kind of this release like holy crap we did it like it was worth it all of that sacrifice all of that that struggle was worth it um and we we, we downed a whole bottle of champagne in probably like 15 minutes <laughs> it was just like it was it was it was great i called um uh, my dad um it was you know, and I told him, hey, you know, uh, check the news in in a few days. Uh, What'd your dad say? What was the first thing he said to you? It, it, I, I don't remember. I don't remember actually what he said. Uh, I just in such a daze at that point. Yeah, I don't remember. I, I can't even tell you what word he says, but I just remember being so excited. And then the night before, uh, uh, the night before the, the news broke, because, you know, it's a publicly traded company, so you can't say oh such and such is buying we got to be very tight um about that so i didn't share that with anybody even my parents didn't know who um uh had, had acquired us but there's a couple of my like really close friends that you know we've come up with each other it's junior high high school college and stuff like that and the the, the inside joke goes you like, oh you kind of look like dave Chappelle, or whatever right <laughs> oh, that's what people used to say i think i'm you know better looking no no no, you know, no, 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 no hating on you, Dave, but. But you know, you only just can't unsee that now, right? You just didn't. Yeah, yeah, well, it, just didn't. it is what it is. Right, and so there's one of those um, memes where Dave Chappelle is holding like a, a boatload of money and the, you know, I'm rich, bitch, I'm whatever. Rich, yeah. I literally, in the group chat, I sent it to like all my closest boys and then everybody, as soon as I did they that, do. they were like, oh shit, you sold the company, you sold the company. And I was just like, check the news tomorrow. Um, and so that was the, that was that, that it was, it was cool. What was it like to, when you went back to work? So, you know, the senior executive. Two years now, right? Or did you just, yeah, or two, you just did, okay. two, two, two years. So we did, um, uh, structured, you know, we did cash up front and then we did, uh, additional like stock and stuff on the, on the back end. Um, uh, the, so remember now this is in COVID. So we, we, we sold the company in October of 2020 so the whole team had been remote since march Seven months in, right? right so it wasn't there wasn't going into the office unfortunately to to celebrate that in person we actually didn't see each other as a company to celebrate it until I invited every, everybody over to our house in june of 21 mm -hmm. is where we actually got to celebrate wow so we had an all company Teams Zoom. meeting, right? <laughs> um, so we had we're on Teams, and we had just switched from Zoom to Teams, actually. So everybody's still kind of figuring out what the hell they're doing. <laughs> and um, the senior execs knew because they were part of the diligence process, right, for months. So they knew, but to for the rank and file it was cool. And and what we had done was a few months before, so sometime in the summer, I'd bonused all the rank and file stock because I knew it was happening too, and I was like, I can't afford to give you guys cash, and I got it. But um, we had bonus stock. So everybody had a lot more stock than what they had been contracted to get. So to and so risk. so it was it was cool. And then I think after, you know, hearing people, you know, buying their first house or, you know, did this or 
you know, hey, I had a kid or, you know, went out and bought a crazy car or, you know, paid, they paid off their student loans, whatever. Um, they all earned it, you know? I don't feel like I gave them. I feel right. like they they helped give me um, an opportunity and a, and a change, so. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. So now, two years goes by, you crush it. You 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 turn in your 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 fob and you leave the company. And now you are, and I met you and you told me, I'm going to open an MLS, I'm going to start an MLS team or I'm going to attract an MLS team into Connecticut. I'm going to build a stadium and I am going to bring a a, a team here. And uh, tell us quickly about that journey. Uh, first, ah. Why, why all, the, all the national teams, first of all, let me just set the stage, right? Mm. The Whalers are gone, mm-hmm. right? We have no NHL team. The minor league teams have failed. The baseball teams have failed. We have no football. But you believe that we should have an MLS team in Connecticut and that it'll be successful. You got to see something that people can't see. Yeah, I think I think it not only be successful, I think it could be one of the top 25 most valuable clubs in the world mm-hmm. within a decade. Um, so you're, Connecticut is the most densely populated and affluent market in America without any of the top five sporting leagues. No NFL, no NBA, no NHL, no MLB, no MLS. Um, Connecticut is the highest soccer viewing market in the country without uh, MLS or NWSL, the, the, the women's soccer league. Connecticut um, residents spend over $1 billion a year on tickets and merchandise to out-of-state teams, right? When Connecticut has no tolls, but Connecticut fans go pay Massachusetts tolls, to, <laughs> they go pay New York tolls, all that, all that, that tax revenue, that small business revenue leaves the state, right? Um, but yet we are the biggest, most loyal fans. Um, and so I look at, when I look at the viability for opportunity in Connecticut for top tier pro sports, we already have the Connecticut Sun and the WNBA, right? And they do well, right? They compete for the Eastern Division Championship. They're the playoffs on a on regular basis. And they're actually in one of the more, the, the, the less densely populated parts of the state, right? I mean, they have the casinos to draw, but they're not where the real population is, right? Between Hartford and and and, and Greenwich, right? Um, and so, so, so for that reason, I think there's a, a, a lot of pent up demand and opportunity there. And we've hired all the market research firms to validate that over the last two years. So it's not just speculation. We have all the data. We have the consumer surveys. We have the the market feasibility study, the financial feasibility study. The next thing that is really important in terms of having a team is having a really great stadium experience. And the part of that experience, you could build a nice stadium anywhere, but the one thing that is really hard is to get one in an urban area close to public transportation, right? And so we looked for two and a half years for land and we were able to find land in Bridgeport on the water. So next to the only, you know, deep water marina between New York and Boston. So you can come by boat, ferry, it's right off of I-95. You can come by the highway. It's 500 meters from Metro North Amtrak and and the bus terminal. So you're talking about the most transportation transportation rich stadium location in the entire East Coast, right? Better location than Jersey, Philly, Foxborough, um, anything. So when I say, okay, I have a densely populated area with high disposable income amongst the highest soccer viewership interest, um, and I have potentially the best transportation rich location for a stadium uh in an area that that needs urban redevelopment and opportunity and jobs and stuff like that i would ask instead of people saying can it be successful i don't ask how the hell could it not be right (laughs) i don't have the you know if mls is also serious about being one of the top leagues in the world right we have copa america hosted here in the u.s next year the year after that we have the club world cup the year after that we have the world cup then two years after that, we have the Olympics, both men and men and women. So you have four of the five largest soccer tournaments in the world will be hosted on U.S. soil. And that is, a, to me, an immense opportunity for MLS to, 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 to jump up to one of being, being one of the top leagues in the world. That's not to even mention Messi and all the other stuff that's going on. But you can't be one of the top 
five leagues in the world if you don't have teams that are number one in their market or number two in their market. And you, you can't be the third, fourth, fifth team in every market. So to me, MLS also going in and getting another team in a city that already has an NFL team, an NBA team, an MLB team, just is nonsensical from a strategic business sense. So if you have a media market like Connecticut that is bigger than a third of the media markets MLS is already in, right? Mm -hmm. um, and can be the number one show in town, that's also strategically makes a lot of sense for everybody. And then we talk about the importance of regional rivalries with New York and um, New England Revolution and, and Philly and stuff like that. Um, so I look, I- Who's funding all the research? Me. So everything- you, every, you put every, it all in now? Everything is self-funded. My wife and I have fronted the bill for everything over the last couple of years. Yeah. So how long do you think it's gonna take you to get it up? So our hope is to be able to put in a bid you know, obviously we have to put in, build uh, the, the rest of our ownership group. Um, but we want to, we want to put in a formal bid for expansion um, for both MLS and NWSL in 2024. Next year. Yeah. We want to put the bids in. Obviously the teams won't be running. It, yeah. But we want to no, no, put in our, we want to put the bids in and say, say no. I like, love it. Listen, <laughs> I, 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 you know what I love? I love the fact that you, you throw out, it's very clear that you throw out these these big visions, right? That I'm going to sell a company by the time I'm 40. I'm going to sell a company for a hundred million. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Like you are very deliberate about your goals and you are, and you're open about them. You say them out loud. I, I say it to, honestly to lock myself in to have to do it. Yeah. So That's a pride thing. That's like, all right, if I say it, I'm going to do it. I got to do it. Cause then people are going to say he failed. And I don't want people to think, all right, we got to get, we got to get you back on the show. I'm just watching the clock. So, so we're going to, so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to raise capital. We're going to get how much money we're going to raise next year, this year. Right now. So for a full MLS team, um, it's going to be a lot, yeah. right? Stadium um, is almost $600 million. Yeah. The expansion fee, the last expansion fee was over over half a billion, so it's not going to go down. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a significant raise. Obviously, that's some of that's fine. It's, some, it's paid over time, so it's not somebody dropping that type of cash. Mm -hmm. But it, it's it's substantial. But the impact to the, the economic development impact to the community will be um, massive. And I think it, you know, Connecticut, Connecticut fans deserve it, and Connecticut's got some of the literally the, the most loyal. Think about it, the Whalers weren't even good. Yeah, right. You still people, rock their shit. People love them, and they still quarter, rock that age. A quarter century later, for a team that was mediocre at best, yeah, because it was theirs. They just have pride in something that represented them, and I think they would latch on to a team. And I, I got too big of ego to not be good. We'll be good. Well, listen, <laughs> we're, we're known for going into the Joe Rogan territory of two to three hour uh, uh, podcasts. I know you don't have the time to do that today, but I'm sure we, if you're well, if you're, you're welcome to come back anytime, we'd love to have catch ups on what you're doing. Um, I would, I, I love your your vision. I love your your energy. Um, I think I speak for everybody in the audience. It, where can people find you if they want to reach out to invest or talk to you? Yeah, so uh, LinkedIn, Andre Swanston. I'm I'm pretty good about. Uh, it may take me a while because I get a ridiculous amount of emails, but I, I try to, to to reach back out to people. Um, uh, I would say the best place because because then other people can make sure it doesn't uh, fall through the cracks is uh, swanston.org, S-W-A-N-S-T-O-N.org. And, you know, you can link to all the different businesses and things that we're doing. And uh, we've got team members that will make sure it doesn't get lost in the sauce. We need to talk about Swanston Labs, unfortunately, but the time is up. I would love to have you stay, but we'll have you for a part two. If you're absolutely your game, would love, would love to do it. This has been fantastic. As always, stay forward obsessed. Thank you for listening to Forward Obsessed. Please share this episode, subscribe, and leave a review on your podcast app. This episode was hosted by Pete Senna and David Salinas from the Digital Surgeons Podcast Studio in New Haven, Connecticut. Special thanks to our AV crew, Steve Walter and Meg Olson. Forward Obsessed is produced by Robert Roach. If you'd like to contact our team, visit us at forwardobsessed.com.